Good morning. Welcome to Faith Church Adult Sunday School on this cold but sunny Sabbath day. We are studying the book of Nehemiah. If you've been following along, you know that we are now into chapter five. We'll probably finish chapter five today and try to get into part of chapter six. But before we do that, let's pray and then we'll dive into the word of God. Lord, we do thank you for this sunny Sabbath day. We thank you for a day to come and worship, a day to hear your truth in the word of God proclaimed. And I pray that we will see Jesus in this book. We will see redemptive history and see how much you love your people and see what you're doing and how that applies today. Lord, we thank you for a savior like Christ Jesus. I pray that as we prepare to worship, you would give us hearts that want to hear your word and to believe it. And I pray for John as he preaches that he would do so well and that he would do so in a way that pleases you. Pray for each one here now on this uh, Zoom study that you would bless them richly. And may all things be to your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, good morning again. And as I said, we are now into chapter five. But to before we start looking at some of the slides and read uh, part of chapter five, let's catch up as to what's taken place. And if you remember um, a couple chapters ago, the rebuilding on the wall had started and initially it was going um, great. Uh, people from all walks of life, all ages, all vocations were helping in. And it was a, a spirit of unity that you don't typically see. And it was, I guess, what you would call a real revival. And then as always, there are challenges, there's opposition. And we saw some that were from without, from outside. And so God's enemies now starting to come against uh, the people as they continued their work. And then last week we saw a conflict from within the church, uh, problems that were inside, not uh, external. So this morning, we're going to look at a couple of things. We're going to look at uh, internal conflict. We're going to look at Nia, Nehemiah's response. And then we're going to look at uh, personal attacks and assaults on Nehemiah himself. Before we get started, I'm going to go back to something I've said a couple of times during this study, or at least a question that I've asked and we've uh, begun to answer. And that question is, why is it so important to rebuild the city of Jerusalem? What is it about Jerusalem that is so critical to the nation of Israel that it has to be rebuilt and it has to be rebuilt in a certain way? And of course, we've started to answer that question through seeing that, uh, number one, God has said that it would be so. God is the one who initiated the idea of them having a, having a city for themselves. And more importantly, it's God ways of God's way of showing that they are to be set apart, that they are a unique nation, and they are set apart for him to worship him, and that he will be their God, and they will be his people, and he will provide for them, he will protect them. And we know historically, as we look at uh, the beginning of the city of Jerusalem, going back to, I think it's 1000 BC, when the city was first um, captured, there have been a lot of challenges, a lot of issues. A lot of those 
were uh, self-created. But God over the years always graciously showed mercy. He overcame uh, their enemies. And so here we are now rebuilding the city. And you might ask, what does that have to do with today? As I was thinking about the lesson this week, I thought about the parallels to, to, to today where um, we are in a very challenging time in a number of ways. Because of COVID, we can't worship exactly like we have in the past, exactly maybe the way we want. And it's not ideal. We also have, um, over the years in a post-Christian culture, opposition from outside. So there is a parallel. And so then you have to ask the question today, why is it so important that we gather together and worship and as best we can um, have worship, um, have the preaching of the scriptures in the pattern that we have in the past? And the, the simple answer is that that's the way God designed it. Uh, we didn't design or outline what worship looks like. God has done that through the scriptures. But it's really important that even with some of the restrictions we have, and I know John has mentioned this to me, that we normalize our church practices and worship as much as possible because that's the way that God has intended it to be. Now, you can look around and you see some churches have still not had any in-person worship at all. Some churches are uh, only doing online. Some don't have those abilities, and they're relying on the people to either um, worship on their own or study on their own. And there's a real, uh, I think, a real threat there uh, to the church if we don't, uh, if we aren't able to worship as God has intended us. And I've heard, I was talking to a friend and he said that uh, in California, some of the churches out there who haven't been back in person at all are planning for losing as much as 30% of their congregation. And that's, that's not just one church, that's in general. Um, and that, that is sad. So again, you can see a parallel between the challenges that we have, they're different, and between uh, the challenges that they had in rebuilding um, the city, uh, the temple in Jerusalem, and the importance of having that set up so they can worship the way that God has intended. And so here we are, we're, we're doing a study via Zoom, uh, doing the best that we can. It's uh, it's not ideal. I'd rather be looking at faces out in the chairs and seeing you, but uh, we are moving forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're studying the word of God. And uh, to that point, we are in chapter five now. And when we, I'm um, going to go ahead and share my screen and then bring up the last slide that we had as we finished last week. If you would, Open your Bibles in the meantime while we're doing that to Nehemiah uh, chapter 5, please. And hopefully you are now seeing my screen. And as we finished um, last week, we talked about the problems that they were having and the problems are from within and they're significant. And there were three complaints that were uh, being made by the Jews and I'll, I'll kind of hit those quickly since we talked about them last week. Um, there were three basic situations. There were families who had no land and they're hungry, they're working, but they don't have any money or food. And so they're not able to provide for their families. Uh, the second problem was the people that had land were having to mortgage this in order to buy, mortgage their property to buy food. And on top of it, there's a famine. So people were doing some things that were out of desperation. Uh, they were selling their children as temporary servants to, to pay debts. And then the, uh, the worst uh, thing that was happening 
was that there were people that couldn't pay their taxes. They already have property mortgage and some of them were to the point of selling their children into a form of slavery. And if we remember from last week, we went back and we looked at uh, Leviticus and we saw that there, there was, um, there were allowances for people to be, go into a form of servanthood. The conditions were very strict. It was not the same as the slavery that we're talking about here, uh, but that's not what was happening. Actually, what was happening was very similar to what those outside the church, if you will, were doing, which is uh, a real form of slavery. And this is bad for for two reasons. One is it's not being done in accordance with the word of God. And secondly, they're doing the same thing that the heathen nations were doing as well. And they've got people going into slavery. And that's kind of brings us up to where we're at today. And what we're going to look at first is Nehemiah's response to what is happening. Because the, the critical thing I want you to see here is that if they start engaging in these practices, they're no different or better than the heathens or pagans outside the church. And um, that is never a good thing. So we're going to pick up this morning at um, verse, actually verse six. And this is Nehemiah's response to what he hears is happening. I'm going to go ahead and read from verse 6 through 13 first, and that'll kind of give us an idea of how Nehemiah reacts initially, and then we'll uh, in a few minutes finish the rest of the chapter. Hear the word of God. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this, abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priest and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they promised. So what we see here is a really strong and immediate response from um, Nehemiah. The first thing that we see in verse 6 is, is anger. He's upset with how the people are being treated. And if you take note at the beginning of that passage that I read, he mentions that they had actually started to buy back some of the slaves that had been sold to the nations. That term, the nations, means those other countries outside the nation of Israel. So this practice that had taken place where the nations have made slaves of, uh, of the people of God, now they were starting to buy them back. But what happens is the same practice then starts from within. And uh, so you can imagine um, how bad that is, that you're acting like the countries around you who are, are pagan. And so his response is anger. And what we're going to see throughout the rest of the book is that Nehemiah is not only a great man of God, he's also 
a great leader and administrator. God has really gifted him in many ways. Well, the first thing that he does is he's, he takes careful consideration because this is a very complex problem. It doesn't just uh, demand an immediate angry response of stop doing this. He has to, um, first of all, think about how are we going to do this? And then he has to get the rest of the leaders engaged so that they are on board with this as well. So he calls a meeting and he invites the nobles and other officials and he brings charges against them. And he says, you're guilty for exacting interest from your fellow countrymen and profiting from their suffering. And this is something he appeals to the law. This is something that was forbidden in the law. You could find that in Deuteronomy 23, 19. And so those are pretty serious charges. And if you go back to the passage that I just read, and he doesn't mince any words, he doesn't try to, to kind of soft pedal the situation, but he uh, says to them in verse nine, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nation Taunts of the nations, our enemies. As I was going through this study, and I thought, okay, um, there is a lot there, but how does this apply to us? And I'm going to stop for a moment. And, and what we're going to see here is that their public conduct didn't really reflect what their stated beliefs were. So you know what that makes us when we do that? It makes us a, a hypocrite. And you see from the um, response there that the, the threat is that the nations, again, the nations meaning those outside the nation of Israel, that they'll see and they will mock them for their behavior, even though they were doing the same thing that the quote unquote nations were. We have to consider that today. Does our public conduct reflect what we say we believe? Because again, we run the risk then of compromising our witness to those around us. And um, I've had some interesting uh, conversations about the, the topic of uh, hypocrisy. And um, often from people that aren't believers or those outside the church, are those that have left the church. One of the most common themes you'll hear when you ask people, why don't you go to church or why did you leave a church? They'll say, because the people there are uh, hypocrites. And I used to get very defensive about that and try to defend the fact, well, they're really not. Then I realized that uh, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. And a lot of times uh, I and others in the church are, if we're honest with ourselves. I'm not saying that we set out to be that but that we can be. And so we have to take a look at that and say, you know, is that a, is that a valid point? And I would say yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that we can all fall into that pattern of doing one thing um, after we've said another, and that really damages our witness. But secondly, I would say no in some cases, because it's an easy out if you say, I don't want to be in the church because they're all hypocrites. Um, you've just said that I'm, I'm, I'm better than the people in the church and I can't be around them. So take that for what it's worth. But anyway, um, back to where we're at. Um, this is the, the problem is that people are, are being hurt by this and those outside the church are taking note. So the charges are brought against these nobles and officials. And it's interesting in verse 10 that... Um, Nehemiah admits his own involvement in this practice. And so that kind of brings up a, a sticky subject. Was he literally doing this um, or was he identifying with their sin? And the answer could, could be um, both. And, you know, they mentioned the fact that they are, it says, uh, my brothers and servants are lending them money and grain. 
Now, so what's the problem with that? The problem is that the interest being charged was exorbitant. It really um, should be a very small amount. Now, the going rate in the Persian Empire um, outside the church was 40 to 50 percent a year. So these would have been your equivalent of the uh, the earlier version of the uh, the loan sharks, as, as people would call them today. Uh, 40 or 50 percent would put you in a position where you could never pay it off. So basically, you were always in debt. The problem with that is it's not in the spirit of Leviticus uh, 25. And there were very clear um, rules and regulations on how we were to treat our, uh, our fellow brothers and how we were to conduct business. And they weren't following that. And so here we have, again, we have uh, Nehemiah responding uh, making accusations and admitting that he was part of the problem. You know, that's one thing you, you'll typically find of great leaders. They, they will often admit that they, have, they are part of the problem or they have some responsibility or culpability. If you ever hear someone say, uh, I have no part in this, I didn't do this, uh, you may want to take a closer look at, at, uh, at that person. So again, um, we see here that this practice also of selling slaves to non-Jews was considered inhumane behavior and literally an abomination in the sight of God. And Nehemiah, as you see here, says this must stop. He wants it to stop immediately. Now, when you think about what's taking place, and that some people are profiting from this, um, you might expect a bit more of a difficult response or, or a challenge back to uh, Nehemiah, but through hopefully through God working and Nehemiah's strong re, uh, response, they agree to comply. And you see that in verse immediately, they said, we will restore these who require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Now, he takes this a step further, and look at this carefully because it's important. It says in verse 12, and I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. So now he has, um, if you will, the, the spiritual leaders, religious leaders involved, and he actually makes them take an oath. And taking an oath then was a serious, serious matter. Um, if you want to, you can go look at in Jeremiah um, 34, verses 8 through 22, and it talks about oaths and curses. And this wasn't anything like just saying, oh, sure, we'll, we'll do that. Um, this is actually taking an oath and then agreeing that if you don't keep it, that you will bring down all the curses upon yourself that come along with breaking that oath. So this is a, a serious matter in those days, taking an oath. But he's smart in that he gets the priest to agree to this. So now there's some, some backbone behind this. And he, he does something that looks like it's symbolic in 13. And, and I've got up here on the screen, it says, I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. And this was more than just um, symbolism, he's telling them that this, this, when you would shake out your garment, it was to show that there was nothing there, that you're not hiding anything. And he's saying, so may God also shake out every man from his house. In other words, may they be exposed. And so this is more than just a symbolic um, act, although it is to a degree uh, symbolic. So keep that in mind as we move forward. So Nehemiah takes this a, a step further, and we're going to look at what Nehemiah personally does now in the next section. So uh, a lot of times people will ask uh, others to do something or to sacrifice, but they're not willing to do it themselves. A great leader is typically also willing to, uh, to sacrifice 
um, as well. So we're going to see that. I'm going to stop for a moment and I'm going to see if there are any questions. And I'm not, uh, let's see here. I'm not seeing any, so we will press forward. Okay, turn back to your Bibles again. Chapter 5, we're going to read through the end of the chapter here. And the heading on mine says, Nehemiah's Generosity says, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall and we acquired no land and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was pre prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds and every 10 days, all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Okay, so at first glance, if you read this, you might say, wow, Nehemiah is spending this section praising himself blowing his own horn, saying, look at me, and then asking God to remember what he's done for the people. If you read it that way, you missed the point. Nehemiah is setting an example, and he's recounting his example and why that is important here. The first thing, well, one of the first things he mentions is that he forgoes his allotted food allowance which went along with being the Persian governor in Jerusalem. And uh, we see that in verse uh, 14. He was uh, the governor during this period, at least, for 12 years. And he actually points out um, the dates. So he has, what he's saying is, I had a right to um, have this food allowance, and I didn't take it. So he's pointing out that he did, uh, in a certain sense, practice of self-sacrifice. He also used some of his own men to do the work on the wall. So again, this is a form of charitable giving. And he points out that this is a big deal because at his table, there were 150 men. And he outlines there some of the rations that, that they had. And he still, even though, again, he points out, again, even though he had the right to he doesn't take advantage of this situation and by doing this he's setting an example it's not so much that he's saying look at me look how great and how wonderful i am as look at it as he's setting an example and he's meeting remember with these other nobles and officials to do like i've done practice some self-sacrifice here show some restraint. And of course, we know our model for self-sacrifice is Christ. You could turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, and let's read a couple of verses from there. Take a look. And I got lucky. I flipped over. I didn't have it marked, and it came right to it. It's great when that happens. And this is uh, an example of Christ's humility. So I'm going to read verses six and seven. Um, actually, I'll go back to five. 
have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And as you read those words and see that that's the model of self-sacrifice and humility, because uh, Christ, among anyone else, had the right, the right to do what he wanted, being equal with God. But he chose to come down in the form of a man so that those who he's calling to be his people would benefit. And so that's the model of self-sacrifice that we can never um, attain ourselves. We can't, we can be Christ-like, but the model there is Christ and in his self-sacrifice. So again, we see here that Nehemiah is trying to say that I'm willing to sacrifice and likewise you should as well. Um, we also see in this passage that they, he has the right to collect taxes as well. And I'm looking at this, um, and I'm not sure it's mentioned so much in this passage, but he finished, he did have the right even to collect taxes. And he finishes the, the chapter here by saying, remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Um, it's interesting because you could read that and say he's being a bit selfish by saying, remember, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Or you could read that differently and read it as um, remember me and he is putting his faith in God. Um, I think the second is I, as I read the comment. Um, as I as I read this and I read the commentary uh, by by Derek Thomas, it's more evidence of his faith than it is wanting to get special attention or calling attention to himself. It's rather that his faith is in God to do this. All right, so we're going to move on to, to chapter six. Before I do that, I'm going to look and see if there, actually, I believe there is a question or a comment. So the, the, the comments and the question are centered around that I have here on the screen are that uh, Nehemiah rebuked the nobles and officials and that he had authority. And then um, also before it gets to the question here points out that, that today people are polarized that we lack depth in issues and morality regard things as subjective and are easily offended. What can we do other than praying and voting to follow Nehemiah's example? Anything at all? And that's a good question. And so uh, the question asked there, other than praying and voting. And what I would say is, in addition to that, we also can set an example by leading like Nehemiah did, by willing to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. We see a lot of cases where people talk a good game, and I won't use any example of the politicians during COVID that have done things like that. You read the news or look at your phone, whatever your, uh, your source is, and you can see many examples even today of people that say, uh, don't do as I uh, do, do as I say, where they say one thing and do another. So say in addition to praying and voting, uh, 
we have to set a good example and we have to walk the walk and be consistent with what we do so that it matches up with what we say we believe as Christians. So that would be a short answer to that. It's probably more complex than, than, than I'm making it, but really by being willing um, to, to humble ourselves and be able to set an example. And sometimes you have to take the, uh, the higher ground in some of these matters because, um, you know, personally assaulting people is not the answer. Holding people accountable is one thing, but when it becomes personal, uh, that's never productive. So that's another thing I would say is that not to let these matters get necessarily personal, even though they are, as we're going to see, that's a good lead into the next uh, chapter here. And I'm waiting for the computer to cooperate here. Okay, so as we finish up this chapter, uh, a few final uh, points to make about Nehemiah. And this should be a good example for us. We see in verse 15, that um, he mentions the fear of God. And we, we see that, we see that Nehemiah feared God more than he feared men. And that's actually something that we can pray for our leaders, that they would be men and women who fear God. But today you see it's more common, I believe, unfortunately, that they fear uh, fellow men. Um, he also lived for God's glory. He wanted to bring every area of his life into conformity with the obligations of covenant life. So when he pointed out the um, practices, the sins or the faults of others, he was willing to take a look at his own life and conform it to God's word as well. And he mentions in here, you'll, you'll see a theme throughout the book that um, he realizes God has shown love to him, has been gracious to him, and he loves God. Uh, because God first loved him. He also takes God's word seriously. You'll, you'll mention, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, see mentioned in the passage that we just read that when he asks people to do something, he's referring to God's word, whether it be how you treat servants, whether it be taxes, whether it be oaths, he um, takes God's word seriously. So what does, what does the gospel produce? What type of fruit? Um, we see some good fruit here in terms of men repenting. And this is a list that you could take a look at uh, at your leisure from Galatians 5.22. And it produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. So if you want to look at your life and see if you're producing good fruit, in the way we respond uh, to God and to his word, this is a list you could use as sort of, of a checklist to kind of ask yourself, am I producing this, uh, this fruit that the gospel should bring along with it? <clears throat> Excuse me, all right. So we're gonna segue into chapter six. And as I mentioned before, a lot of the challenges and problems for from outside, excuse me, outside the church in general, then we see these challenges inside. Now we're going to see a personal attack on Nehemiah. He's not just recognized as a leader by his own people, but those outside the church also realize that he's a great leader. Uh, it comes with the territory. If you even today, if you are a great leader, if you stand up and speak up for truth, for what is right, you automatically become a target. And we're going to see that uh, in a very real, very dramatic way in uh, the next half of this chapter in, in six. So let's read that. It's fairly lengthy. And so maybe I'll read uh, 
the first nine verses. We'll take a look at those and hopefully we can get down through verse 14. Um, the heading on my Bible in chapter six says conspiracy against Nehemiah. Now, when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm, and I sent messages to them saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop? Well, I leave it and come down to you. And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to, pro to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of those reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say have been done, for you're inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Okay, so let's take a quick look at these uh, men who are initially uh, trying to convince Nehemiah, they just want to meet with him and have a discussion. And they're familiar names. You've, you've uh, seen them earlier in the book, but now they become uh, a much bigger part of the, the story in this chapter. We, got, we have Sanballat here who uh, was, uh, his name's Babylonian, and he's also referred elsewhere uh, as a Horonite, a, a native of Beth Haran, and this was a place about 18 miles northwest of Jerusalem. He was governor of Samaria in 407 BC, and he may have, we say stress the may have married a Jew, although he's not Jewish. We have Tobiah, which it's a Jewish name, and he has family connections with a high ranking official in Jerusalem. And it's possible he's already a governor uh, also. And then Geshem, who's the most powerful of the three, he and his son rule a group of Arabian tribes that had taken over uh, Edom and Moab. So these are three um, fairly powerful men. These are uh, not just uh, anybody. They're very powerful men. And they become the main source of Nehemiah's opposition. They're, they've taken note of what he's doing um, he's been successful, and now they perceive this as a threat. But what it really amounts to, this is a uh, unholy opposition against the God of Israel. Nehemiah just happens to be the leader at, at this point. Um, they're probably observing that as the city is being built and wondering, what does this mean for us? Do we have now uh, some more competition? Do we have another threat? These people who were weak, who were a non-factor, uh, now they're going to have uh, a city with a wall. And what does that mean to us? So you can see that they, they set out to do three things. And we'll outline those as we go through the chapter. They're going to, uh, throughout this, they're going to threaten to harm him. They're going to try to frighten him away. And they're, they're going to try to discredit him. And... You know, it's, it's interesting, thousands of years later, those tactics, if you want to smear somebody or hurt somebody, haven't changed. Intimidation, um, fear, uh, and ruin their reputation, all those things are still used today. And it's pretty rudimentary uh, tactics that are being used. But uh, Nehemiah is more than ready uh, for them. You can see that they, they ask him to a political summit for talks. This would be, um, and not, not to be silly, but this would be the modern day equivalent of uh, 
if the mafia said, let's go for a ride. Um, they asked him to go to a political summit for talks. And it's interesting, <clears throat> we'll get to this in a moment, but the place they choose is as far away as you can get in the country without going out of the country. Um, you know, and of course, they frame this up as they want a, a common trade agreement that's going to benefit all of them. Now, there's two things here you have to be aware of. One is Nehemiah didn't get into the position that he's in uh, by not being savvy. And number two, he has God on the side. And I know uh, all of you have probably seen instances where something just didn't uh, feel right. And it was more than just a feeling. It's God's way sometimes of guiding us. And we have that sense that something uh, isn't right. Because he says in verse two, but they intended to do me harm. It doesn't say exactly how uh, he knew that, but either it had been leaked out, either through prayer, that he had a sense that God was, was speaking to him. And, but he knows that they're up to no good. And he, he doesn't play their game. In verse 3, he says, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop when I leave it and come down to you? So it's a pretty smart response. It's almost like I'm too busy. I'm too busy to meet with you. But these enemies are persistent. We you saw as we read that they made their request uh, four times. But each time, Nehemiah gives the same response. So they're not, that doesn't work. Uh, kind of luring him away, getting him alone. Uh, but doing this four times shows that they're getting desperate. And desperate men are typically dangerous men. So they change their tack then. If they can't do this the way they'd like to, let's um, let's uh, smear him. You know, if we can't, let's ruin his reputation. And let's make some, uh, you know, insinuations here about uh, what Nehemiah is up to. So they, they sent this fifth invitation. And uh, now things are no longer cordial. Um, they accuse him that basically you want to rebel and you want power. You want, uh, you want to be king and you want people to know that. And they also then threatened, you know, to tell King Artaxerxes. Now, going back to the study that we had in Ezra, and we know from what we studied so far in Nehemiah, uh, these kings, and Artaxerxes is no different, the one thing they do like is stability. They don't like trouble. They don't like um, problems. And so if King Artaxerxes thinks that Nehemiah and um, uh, and his his uh, leaders there are making trouble. That's not going to make the king happy. And so by doing this, by threatening to do this, he could not only stop the work; it could put um, the nation of Israel back into a dangerous situation. So this threat is real. They have these men that are doing this. Do have some power and they know how kings operate so um, you would think this might work you might say you know maybe if you're Nehemiah I'll take step back and take a another look at this but what does he says he just refutes what they're saying he he says to them no such things as you say have been done for you're inventing them out of your own mind for they all wanted to frighten us thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. So he basically just refutes their accusations and tells them that they're liars. But as we'll see, this is the important part of this passage is that he says, but now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Because even though he responds to them and says that what they're saying is false, he also knows that without God's aid, that these men could succeed, that this isn't an idle threat. And he says, God strengthened my hands. 
So he's looking to God to be the one who resolves this situation. And we, we also see that he does not respond to this point with retaliation or revenge. But as we, we're going to read here, and I think this might finish this up for today, responds as the psalmist does in Psalm 31, 18 through 20. So I'm going to turn back, turn over to that rather, and read that for us. Psalm 31, 18 through 20, if you want to follow along. Let the lying lips be mute which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and work for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. So the psalmist is asking a couple of things and he's declaring a couple of things about God. Number one, he says, let the lying lips be mute. So he's asking God to um, stop them from lying. And then he points out the attributes of God, how good God has been for those who fear him, how he's a refuge, how in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. And so he's pointing out that God is the one who will hide them. He doesn't have to connive. Uh, Nehemiah's response was very straightforward and simple. He didn't uh, have to refute point by point. He just basically says that they're lying and that he's going to rely uh, upon God. And at this point, he doesn't respond with retaliation, um, but he's really looking to God in this situation because things could quickly get really um, seriously uh, dangerous. And we're going to see as we look forward, if you would, for next week, read ahead, read chapter, chapter, um, the rest of chapter six and uh, into chapter seven, if you would. But we're going to see next week that he's also not just having to deal with those outside the church, but that there are people even from within who are deceitful and dangerous. So finish um, the rest of chapter six, really don't have enough time to finish that this morning, even I hope to, but look at that and see that now a, the uh, problems are internal. And then we'll look at the wall being finished and um, we see that uh, there's the list of the exiles starting to return. So there's a lot to cover in the next week or so, and there's a lot of moving parts. So if you don't read ahead, it might be difficult to fall along as easily because I'm going to have to work through some of this stuff a little more quickly. But we're almost to the, the halfway point of the book, uh, nowhere near uh, the climax. But we're right there in the middle. So we've seen a lot happen and there's a lot to come. So hang in there, stay with it. I'll tell you what, let's pray. And then we will, for those that can worship in person, for those that are uh, unable to worship uh, online then. And um, again, look forward to next week. Lord, we thank you again for this day so we read through um this passage in nehemiah and we see that your work is going forward but it's not without challenges and we see that today that nothing seems to be easy building the kingdom of god but we see that you are the one we can look to our shelter and our refuge but also the one who will guide us forward. Lord, I pray that as we build the kingdom, that we will do so with uh, the passion that Christ had for us, that he loved us so much that he died for us. Prepare us to worship now. Prepare John to preach the word of God and ask for each one here 
that it, you would prepare them for the week ahead, that all that we say and do, we would be not just uh, hearers of the word, but doers of the word, that we would live as what we say we believe. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you.